But introduce myself first. My name is Steve Cromley. I'm a technical economist with Coke Economic Services. Uh, I live up in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, I get a little, I got a little worried when they said, you know, they want a guy that want me to come talk about corn at a cotton and rice conference. You know, I, I thought I was going to be in a little closet, you know, speaking to one one person. But we're at least in a walk-in closet. But uh, you know, but I know I look forward to the interaction this morning. Uh, and everything, and, and talking about nitrogen management for corn, uh, how we can manage our nitrogen and reduce losses. So, so tell me, is it too early to talk football down here uh, after the Saints game? <laughs> yeah, I believe so. I, as I mentioned, I live up up, up in Missouri. I grew up about 80 miles outside Kansas City, and I grew up a lifelong Kansas City Chiefs fan. So, you know, after that championship weekend, you know, I felt pretty bad, but I, I knew Saints, you know, Saints fans felt worse than I did, you know, for sure. You know, I was, I was upset, uh, disappointed, but I know you guys were disappointed and angry. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, really, if you, th if you think about it, we were one long call away and from the Saints being in the Super Bowl, and we were a, a couple inches of defensive lineman being offsides from the Chiefs being in the Super Bowl. So it could be a lot different talk right now than about this weekend. We could be talking about the Saints and the Chiefs in the Super Bowl, which I think is a matchup most people would rather see than what we got coming Sunday. But this talk would be different too, because we'd spend 40 minutes talking about football and five minutes talking about nitrogen. <laughs> Unfortunately, that didn't happen, so we're going to spend 40 minutes talking about nitrogen and five minutes talking about football. Because Colin tells me if I come to Louisiana, I got to talk about football. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about football. Uh, anybody uh, ever uh, hear this saying, know this saying? Three things can happen when you pass, and two of them are bad. Yeah. I uh, looked it up and gets credited to Woody Hayes, the legendary Ohio State coach. Uh, first person I ever heard talk about it was Lou Holtz uh, when he was at Notre Dame. And had an old football coach was our PE teacher, and he would, when he didn't want to do anything in class, we watched, you know, motivational videos from Lou Holtz. And uh, in one of those one of those videos, he he said this: three things when you, when you pass the ball, three things can happen, and two of them are bad. And back then, you know, that was late eighties, nineties. I thought, man, that's perfect. That's great. You know, that's a you know mentality to have. And it didn't help that. I was a fullback at the time too, you know, and so, you know, that was many years ago, about 60 to 80 pounds, believe it or not, but, you know, at that point, all right, you know, let's, yeah, let's run the ball. Um, for the younger people in the crowd, people, you know, there was a position called a fullback, you know, they were a blocking back, you know, we don't really see fullbacks much anymore. Um, that's because back in the day, you know, the, the mentality was, let's run the ball. And they wanted as many people blocking as they could. So you get a fullback in there to be an extra blocker to help run for the uh, run block for the halfback. And uh, it, it, the whole deal was about getting the right numbers and the right blocking scheme. But then if you watch football today, you pretty much know that you don't see a fullback anymore hardly, except maybe on short yardage situations and, and run, running plays. And the whole idea is to pass the ball. And, and, so these days, there's no fullback. We just put out an extra receiver. Take a tight end or put two tight ends in. It's all about getting more receivers out there than it is about getting an extra blocker. And, and that, so the game has evolved over the years from you know, a running league to uh, a passing league. Whether that be, you know, you watch a high school game today, you watch a college game today. Come on, hey guys. Or you watch uh, you know, a pro game today. And there's a lot of factors to go into that on whether you're successful or not. And, you know, if you think about it this way, no day you think, man, do I only have a 33% chance of being successful? Mm -hmm. Well, we know that's not right. If you watch any game today, you know, everybody's throwing, they're throwing the ball over the field. So the first thing I think about is, who's my quarterback? Who's throwing the ball? You know, here in New Orleans, you got a pretty, pretty good one. You know, Drew, Drew Brees has led the, the league the last two years in completion percent. You know, Pat, he's almost my age. I don't think I can throw it to the back of the room. You know, so he, he's done a pretty good job over the years. And so I think this year he had a 74% completion percentage. That's pretty good. 
you know, uh, Patrick Mahomes up in Kansas City. That I'm finally excited that we have a quarterback, you know, to, to root for up there. Uh, he was actually like 66%. You know, I didn't expect it to be that low. He threw for over 5,000 yards, and I thought it would be a lot higher than that. But it was only about 66%. But he did throw for 50 touchdowns. And I think Drew Brees had 32. So but it's all about getting them at the right time and stuff. So, you know, a lot of factors are going to play there. Who's your quarterback? Who's receiving the ball? You know, who's defending the ball? What What's the environmental conditions if you're playing? You know, is it January? You're playing in, in Green Bay on the frozen tundra? You're playing down here in, in you know, in, New Orleans on in the dome and in the turf. You know, those are all going to affect your completion percentage. And by now you're going, what the heck does that got to do with nitrogen <laughs> fertilizer? You know? Well, if we look at nitrogen, when we apply nitrogen, three things can happen and two of them are bad. And in the case of urea, whether that be granular urea or that be UAN, liquid UAN, four things can happen and three of them are bad. You know, obviously the good, we want the plant to take up as much nitrogen as possible. We want our nitrogen completion percentage to be Drew Brees and above. You know, we don't want it to be me throwing the ball because my completion percentage is really low. You know, so we want a Drew Brees type completion percentage. The bad is it can leach on you. And we're going to talk more about each one of these uh, loss mechanism, mechanisms in more detail. But leaching, leaching is just the movement of nitrate below the root zone. So you get excess moisture in your well-drained, sandier soils. That, not, that, that water moves through the soil profile, the nitrogen goes with it. And then if it goes below the root, roots, roots can't take it up, your completion percentage just went down. Okay? And then we got denitrification. Denitrification occurs in your more heavily, uh, poorly drained soils. Okay? And so what happens is you get excess moisture in your poorly drained soils, a lot of soils around here, and you get saturated conditions. The nitrogen in there, the bacteria in there, turn the nitrogen to a gas, and it goes up in the atmosphere on you, and you lose the nitrogen that way. Okay? And then we got volatilization. Volatilization occurs when we apply urea-based fertilizers, or it can occur when we apply urea-based fertilizers. So that would be granular urea or liquid UAN. UAN. I think a lot of times we forget that the U in UAN stands for urea, <coughs> and it is subject to volatilization as well. It is granular urea. And so what happens if you apply that on or near the soil surface, it can convert to ammonia gas, and if that happens, it can go up in the atmosphere on you, and your nitrogen completion percentage just went down. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about each one of those in, in detail, but I wanted to go through... This is a list of our products that we have at Coke Economic Services. And I wanted to go at least through the color scheme and a little bit of the products because I'm going to show you a lot of data and I'm going to switch from product to product and I want you to have at least a little bit of an idea before we get through it what I'm talking about and what we're trying to do with each product, okay? So I'm sure probably a lot of you are familiar with Agritain. You know, Agritain has been around for 20, 30 years, been around for a long time. Uh, it's been the number one urease inhibitor in the market. And so, Agritain, and this is our line of, of green products over here, and those are our urease inhibitors. Those products, like Agritain, protect the urea, or UAN, from volatilization, okay? They're only going to protect from volatilization. We got a new product just launched this week called Anvil. Anvil is uh, powered by what we call Duramide technology. Duramide is a brand new molecule. Uh, that we developed in-house at Coke. Uh, it is a new, uh, brand new urease inhibitor. And so we're proud of that. Um, it contains two active ingredients. So it contains MBPT, which is the active ingredient in Agritain, and the new Duramide molecule. And so we're seeing better performance uh, with Anvil over the Agritain. Longer lasting, uh, works better in adverse conditions. And so we're seeing, seeing that in our trials. And so, but the green products are going to protect against volatilization. Our blue products, we're going to talk a little bit about Super U, and you'll see some Agritain Plus SC. And so, those products are dual inhibitor products. They can contain two inhibitors. So, they contain the urease inhibitor that's in Agritain, so it's going to protect against volatilization. And then it also uh, contains 
a nitrification inhibitor. And that nitrification inhibitor helps protect against leaching and denitrification losses. Okay? So these protect against volatilization. These are going to protect against volatilization, leaching, and denitrification. SUPU is a pre granulated fertilizer uh, where all those ingredients are integrated into the granule. Uh, so you get uh, an even uh, amount of AI for each one of those ingredients in every granule. Uh, it's made in Enid, Oklahoma. And then Agritain Plus SC is our other product that is for UAN. So it contains the same products as SuperU, uh, but we can put it in UAN to protect from leaching, volatilization, and denitrification. Okay? And then Centuro is another one that, uh, that we also launched this last year, this fall. Uh, Centuro on the purple is a nitrification inhibitor. So it only protects against, or it protects against leaching and denitrification. Uh, so it is uh, uh, using an anhydrous and UAN. Okay. So just an overview so you kind of understand when I go switching back, back and forth from uh, data slide to data slide that we uh, kind of have an understanding maybe of what we're talking about. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to spend some time on volatilization first. Volatilization occurs when you've got urea in the presence of the urease enzyme and water. And if this happens on, on or near the soil surface, it converts to carbon dioxide and ammonia gas, NH3 gas. So if that urea hydrolysis process, if this reaction happens on or anywhere near the soil surface, that ammonia gas can go up in the atmosphere and be lost on it. Okay? So your nitro nitrogen completion percentage just went down. You know, the plant did not have a chance or will not have a chance to take that nitrogen up. It's lost and you'll never get it back. And so we always talk about the disease triangle. In order for a disease to occur, you have to have what? You have to have a disease, you have to have the pathogen, you have to have the host, and you have to have the environment. Well, this is kind of like our volatilization triangle. You have to have urea, you have to have the urease enzyme, and you have to have moisture for that to, for a urea hydrolysis to occur. And so, if we're applying, obviously, if we're applying a urea based fertilizer, granular urea or UAA, we're going to have urea. Urease enzyme is everywhere. It's in plant residue, it's in the soil, it's on our skin. It's going to be there. So the real kicker is how much moisture is there. And that's what's really going to drive the, the volatilization. Do you have enough moisture to start breaking down that urea granule or that UAN droplet to kick in this process and have volatilization occur? Okay, so this is the actual chemical reaction that happens in the soil. And so what's important about that chemical reaction is that it pulls hydrogen ions out of the soil solution. And what, when it does that, it raises the pH. It increases the pH and around. And what we're talking about is just, oh, let me go back, pause. Uh, just in the micro environment around, around that granule. So what we're looking at here is this is representing a urea granule. And this is a soil uh, block around that urea granule, okay? And so this is a millimeter, so this is about an inch by inch square maybe around that urea granule. So, but we're talking about really a micro environment, a real small area around that granule. And so we're gonna, what we're gonna do is measure the change in pH over time. And so we have a pH scale from seven to nine and a half. And let's watch what happens when we uh, as that urea, that granular hydro, hydrolyzes. You see a spike in pH around that granule, or a UAN droplet. And in this case, you saw it go all the way up, you saw purple color, all the way up to nine and a half. Okay? And the reason that's important is because as pH increases above seven, seven and a half, that's when ammonia gas is formed rather than ammonia. And so, once it gives above seven and a half, that's when, if this is on or near the soil surface, that's when it's turned into a gas, and that's when it can be lost to the atmosphere on you. Okay, so let's go back and watch that again. And this time, I want you to pay attention. When you start seeing purple color here, I want you to see, look at the timeline. Look, how, look at when that starts to occur. See it purple? When was that? Two days. Within two days. 
So within two days of application, we saw a pH spike up to nine and a half. And we said volatilization starts to occur at seven and a half. So if you're applying your ear UEN and it's not protected, you can lose a lot of your nitrogen if there's moisture there. If you got everything for your volatilization triangle, you can lose a lot of nitrogen within two to three days of application from volatilization. Okay? And that's going to be important to remember as we move forward and look at some of the some of the practices that we commonly use to stop volatilization from occurring. So let's look what happens. Let's compare that if we treated that urea with agartane or urea inhibitor, anvil, or used a super U grain. And let's see what happens there. So you can see you get a rise in pH. We're hitting, uh, you know, eight, eight and a half, but you don't get that, that big spike in pH and, and that you do when it's untreated. So that's what a urease inhibitor does. Urease inhibitor <coughs> slows that process down, that urea hydrolysis process down, and that way you don't get to near the, the spike in pH and you don't have near the volatilization. Okay? Now, imagine what happens if we put two pearls of urea right here. We're going to get a higher spike in pH, or we're going to get that spike in pH is going to last longer. Okay? So there's, there is a concentration effect that will happen here. And, and that will become important as, as, we, as we look at some future slides. Okay, so you as farmers, you as retailers, um, maybe you've heard your neighbor say it, but what are the main objections do you hear or say from not wanting to protect your urea or UAN from volatilization? What are some of the main objections? I'm not going to. I'm not going to spend the money to buy Agritain or buy Super U because I'm going to do this instead. Plowing it in. Plowing it in. When I'm working in, there's one. I usually have three. I'm looking for three. Plowing it in. Water irrigated in. Going to irrigate it in. Going to water it in. Don't believe in. Don't believe in it. Okay, there's a new one. <laughs> uh, that's not the one I'm looking for. There's still another one out there. <laughs> Expenses is always one, okay? Add more urea. I'm going to add more nitrogen, you know? I'm just going to put more on. I'm going to take that money. Rather than buying agritane or buying super, I'm just going to buy more nitrogen. Put more nitrogen on. You know, your fertilizer salesman likes to hear that, you know, for sure. We've all been there, so. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, it's going to rain, or I'm going to water it in. We're going to work it in, or I'm just going to add more nitrogen. And so let's take a look at each one of those objections and see. Yes, you can water it in. But, you know, how much rain do you need or how much irrigation do you need to stop volatilization from occurring? This was a study that was done at Oregon State University. And they determined that you needed eight-tenths of an inch of rain to stop volatilization. Okay? Now, my recommendation is a minimum of a half an inch. But remember, we go back to that uh, pH slide. When did we start seeing volatilization and started seeing that spike in pH? We started seeing it within 48 hours, didn't we? If conditions are favorable for volatilization. So if I'm going to water it in, or I'm going to depend on a rainfall, I need at least a minimum of half an inch of rain, and I need that to occur within 48 hours of application. If not, I'm setting myself up for a risk of losing nitrogen to volatilization. Okay? So let's take a little closer look at that. This is that same data from Oregon State. And we're looking at the gray bar is untreated urea. And the green bar is urea treated with agritin in this case. And so we're looking at the percent nitrogen lost in, in this case. And they applied 100 pounds of nitrogen. So you can convert that percentage over to pounds. Where they didn't apply any moisture or didn't rain or something happened with the irrigation system, but they didn't get any moisture on they lost over 56% of the nitrogen that was applied. Or 56 pounds of nitrogen in this case, because they put 100 pounds on. Where they got a tenth of an inch, they still lost over 50% of the nitrogen. So some of the worst case scenarios we see is where I'm not going to buy the agritane, I'm not going to buy the CPU, I'm going to go out there and apply it, because it's going to rain, there's a chance of to rain tomorrow. Well, yeah, what happens is it comes out, it rains, but it only rains a tenth of an inch. It only rains a quarter of an inch. 
It doesn't, you don't get that full range. In fact, even a half an inch of rain, they still had 15% loss, or they lost 15 pounds of nitrogen. They went out and put on 100 pounds of nitrogen, <coughs> expected to get 100 pounds of nitrogen, and really are only getting 85 pounds of nitrogen. You know? Even with a half an inch, compared to if you would have uh, protected it, you know, less than anywhere from 3 to 6 percent. So, the other thing to point out here, it's not a huge issue here, but the average temperature during this study, and this was uh, measured over 19 days, the average temperature in that study was 45 degrees Fahrenheit. A common myth that we get another one, if I go up north, that's they'll say, well, it's too cold, I don't need to protect my degree. Well, it's driven by, it's an enzymatic uh, reaction, so it's driven by the enzymes in the soil. Yes, temperature plays a role in the rate of volatilization, but volatilization still occur, occurs at cold temperatures, okay? All right, so there, that was the, the moisture piece. Let's look at, I'm going to work it in, okay? I don't think our recommendations for working in or tilling in urea to stop volatilization has changed over the years with our equipment, our tillage equipment. I'm not sure who the first person was who recommended to till in your urea to stop volatilization from occurring, but I know it was a long time ago, <laughs> you know? So, you think back about our tillage, how our tillage has changed over the years. What did we do in the 80s? What was our main purpose of tillage in the 80s? <coughs> what? What's that? Weeds. Weeds. Residue. We wanted to bury the residue, and we wanted to bury the weed seed. And so we were using mold bore plows, a lot of mold bore plows and, and equipment that really turned the soil over. We were burying that stuff six inches deep or more in places. All right? And then we got into the 90s. And then what? We started getting no-till. We started getting conservation tillage. What's our main purpose with conservation tillage these days? We want to keep as much residue on the soil surface as possible so we can stop wind and soil erosion. So if you take a look at most of our tillage equipment today that we use, they're all designed to keep 60 to 80 percent of the residue on the soil surface. Well, if we're using these tillage tools to incorporate our urea, aren't we leaving 60 to 80 percent of our urea or UAN on the soil surface too? I think so. You know, I don't think we've we've changed our recommendations over the years to match our tillage practices. So. If you're going to, you've got a farmer that's going to till in, or you yourself are going to till in urea that's unprotected, or you weigh in, you've got to really ask yourself, am I really getting that buried? Am I really getting it worked into the soil? So again, my recommendation is if you can get it two inches deep and completely buried, you probably are. Right. Okay, so this was a study that was uh, actually done up in Canada, and it's interesting to look at. Now, I'll, I'll remind you, okay, so... It, before we say, oh, that's Canada data, I'm not going to pay any attention to it, the volatilization occurs the same way in Canada that it does here. All the mechanisms and everything are the same. Now, the rates might be a little different, the rate it occurs, in fact, it's going to probably be faster here because of the humidity and temperature, okay? So, if we look at this, we got urea that was banded, it was put in a band, and put two inches deep into the soil. They lost over 25%. They measured that they lost over 25% of the nitrogen now in that situation. They took urea, untreated, broadcasted it on the soil surface, and then tilled it in, worked it in. In that instance, they lost over 15% of the nitrogen that was applied. Untreated urea broadcast and left on, left on top of the soil surface lost about 10% of the nitrogen. And then urea with agritane left on the soil surface was less than 5%. Anybody see what's going on here? Because it seems like it ought to be flipped, right? It seems like this ought to have lost the most, and this should actually be down here. And it actually lost the most. When you took what you would say was the best management practice, and you're losing the most nitrogen. Any ideas? Think back to our volatilization triangle. What do we need? Urea, urease, so they're there. What's the third? Okay, uh, moisture. You have to have moisture. The soil surface was dry. There wasn't enough moisture on the soil surface to start that break that granule down and start that 
hydrolysis process and get volatilization to occur. It's like seeding and moisture. When they put that urea in the soil, there was moisture there. And there was enough moisture in the soil to get that volatilization and start that happening. Okay? Another thing that's happening here is a concentration effect. We talked about the concentration effect earlier. If you take all that urea and you put it in a band, what are you doing? You're concentrating that urea in a band. What do you think is going to happen to that pH that drives volatilization around that band of urea? You're going to spike that pH. You're going to hold that pH up higher longer, and it's more subject to volatilization losses. In this case, we said it was dry. We put that urea two inches, two inches deep. We had dry soil above it, so you had a lot of pore space. It turned into ammonia gas, went up through that pore space, and it was lost as volatilization. Nitrogen, nitrogen completion percentage just went down. Compared to the urea broadcast, yes, you put it down with moisture, but it wasn't concentrated. So therefore, you lost a, a, a lower percentage of it. Okay? Another study. This study is looking at UAN. Okay? And untreated UAN versus UAN treated with agritane. Rates of 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre, 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And in this instance, let's look at the 200 pound of nitrogen. This was um, injected into the soil, side dress injected into the soil. There was a 31 bushel difference between untreated UAN and UAN treated uh, with agritane here. So, one or two things happened. One, they put it, they, they concentrated it, right? They banded it, injected it into the soil, side dress. And one, it was either dry above, and they had volatilization go up through the pore space, or two, it was wet when they injected it, and the knife slot, the culture slot, was left open. And then, you know, it volatilized and, and lost it that way. The other thing I want to start to put Steve, can you watch, make sure I'm on time? I think we got 11.05. Okay. So, you have a point. Woo. We're talk faster. <laughs> uh, anyway, other thing I want to point out here is start looking at the adding more nitrogen is not the right answer. So, look at, let's compare the 200 pounds of nitrogen applied as UAN, treated with agritane. It yielded eight bushel more than 300 pounds of nitrogen untreated. In fact, if you look at the 100 pounds, the 100 pounds didn't yield much less than putting on 300 pounds of untreated that you treated at 100 pounds. Okay? And the reason being is, when we, uh, it's that concentration effect. So if you, the, the higher the rate, the, the you increase the rate, the more granules or more UAN droplets you get per square foot, and you get a higher change in pH, a longer change in pH, you lose a higher percentage of your nitrogen. So this study you know, was done, this was actually done in Brazil. That's why our, our numbers are a little off. So they were converted from kilograms per hectare to pounds per acre. So 62 pounds of nitrogen per acre, untreated versus treated with agritane. They lost 26% of the nitrogen at 62 pounds of nitrogen per acre. But look what happens when they put 107 pounds on. They lost almost half their nitrogen. Same condition, same study, same field, everything. The only difference is the rate of nitrogen. And it's that concentration effect. They lost a higher percentage of it. 62 pounds, they lost 26. 107, they lost 48, almost 50% of it. Let's, let's, look, let's look at this example and let's do some math. Okay, so if I applied 62 pounds of nitrogen and I lost 26% of it, I'd have 47 pounds of nitrogen left in the soil <coughs> compared to 56 if I treat it with agrogen. Now, look what happens at 107. If I put 107 pounds of nitrogen on, I almost double my rate, and I only got 54 pounds of nitrogen left in the soil if I lost 50% of it compared to 95 if I had treated it. In fact, I have just as much or more nitrogen in the soil if I would have treated that original 62 pounds of nitrogen than going up to 107 untreated. Again, it's that concentration effect. You put more on, you lose a higher percentage of it. Now, let's look at some data to back that up. And I'm going to have to kind of hustle through some of these. But this is looking at some uh, Virginia Tech data, um, looking at our new Anvil product that just launched this week. 
And so I show this because this is probably the, the biggest response to a urease inhibitor that I've seen. We got over average, there's four different rates here, 60, 120, 180, and 240 different, uh, pounds of nitrogen along this chart here. And so untreated urea, urea with anvil, and then urea with agritane. And so if you average all those, those rates together, <coughs> The urea with anvil was 65 bushel better than the untreated urea. There was definitely a lot of volatilization occurring. This was applied uh, top dress uh, in season uh, with uh, urea. The other thing is we see the anvil was 11 bushel better than the agritain. So in those adverse conditions, uh, we're seeing a, a you know, better performance from the anvil product and the, and the new duramide molecule. Okay? The other thing I want to point out here is let's look at, at the 240 pounds of nitrogen rate. If we go at the 240 pounds of nitrogen rate, go over to the anvil bar, and so they where they're making about 180 pounds of nitrogen. We were able to produce 180 or 180 pounds, 180 bushel of corn, sorry. We were able to produce 180 bushel of corn uh, with urea treated with anvil at 100 pounds of nitrogen compared to 240 pounds of untreated. We got the same yield with anvil at 100 pounds of nitrogen treated compared to 240 untreated. So again, adding more nitrogen, you know, doesn't make sense. And so I'll go through some of these. Uh, this here is just uh, our anvil data, looking at um, corn, uh, two years worth of data at seven different sites. Uh, we see overall average uh, of all these rates, the anvil was 23 bushel better than, than untreated urea. Uh, the other thing I want to point out here is if we compare the 180 rate. Let's look at 180 treated, so that's the green bar, compared to 240 untreated. Don't have the numbers on here, but you can see that the 180 bushel treated with anvil out yielded 240 pounds of nitrogen untreated. And you'll also see that really the 120 treated wasn't much below the 240 untreated. Now, to kind of make sure to drive this point home, this was a study, this was two years worth of data from University of Missouri, uh, and we're looking at Super U fertilizer. So Super U fertilizer is that pre-granulated granulated product with two, two inhibitors, urease and a nitrification inhibitor. And so we went to the researcher and we said, we want to put, a, put the recommended rate of nitrogen on for this field. And so and that's the 100% rate. And then I said, well, we want to put 80% of that on and 120% on. And so at 100% the recommended rate, which was 140 pounds of nitrogen in this, in this case, the Super U was 32, best, 32 bushel better than the untreated urea. But you also notice that it was 21 bushel better than when we put 120 pounds of untreated on. And that the 80% rate was equal or just a little below than the 120% rate of super U compared to untreated. So you don't think I'm just pulling numbers. This was in the same study, but at the University of Tennessee, West Tennessee. And so again, 80, at the 100% rate, the super U was 33 bushel better than untreated urea and it was 22 bushel better than putting 20% more nitrogen on. In fact, the 80% rate was eight bushel better than, or statistically is equal than the 120% rate of untreated. Same study, same year, different location as the University of Arkansas. And so this was an irrigated field. Uh, you'll again, you'll notice at the 100% rate, Super U was 21 bushel better than untreated urea, and it was 13 bushel better than putting 120% on. In fact, the optimal rate was probably down here at the 80% rate because 80% of Super U was statistically the same as the 100% rate. But the 80% of Super U was, you know, nine bushel better than the 120% rate. So they put 40% more nitrogen on, but got less yield. You know. So that adding more nitrogen doesn't make sense agronomically, environmentally, or economically. Okay, so let's don't forget, I, don't, I just want to make sure we don't forget the UAN piece. And so this was a study that was done University of Nebraska. And so surface dribbled, 
uh, side dress, in season, V5 corn, uh, untreated UAN, and UAN treated with Agritech. And so a 15 bushel uh, response. Same type of study, uh, University of Minnesota, but we got surface dribbled versus injected versus surface dribbled treated. So if we compare the two surface dribbled applications, the UAN with Agritain was 17 bushel better than UAN alone applied on the surface. And it was statistically the same or about four bushel better than the UAN that was injected. And so what we're looking at there is we get into a tight spring or we get into a tight side dress uh, run, you know, I can cover more acres by putting my UAN on the surface than injecting. And so that's what we're looking at there is can I feel confident if I can treat my UAN, put it on the surface, cover more acres, and get as much or more yield than where I'm injecting it and it takes longer, then that's a win. And, and so that's what we're looking at there. Okay, how much time do I got? 15. Okay, I think we can get through that. Let me slow down. <laughs> All right, so let's look at our, any questions on volatilization? All right, so let's look at our below ground pieces, leaching and denitrification. So leaching again occurs on our well-drained, sandier soils and get excess moisture that moves that nitrate through the poor soil profile out where the roots can't get it, and, and then we just can't take it up. Denitrification occurs uh, when we got poorly drained soils and saturated conditions. So the bacteria in that soil, they're like you and I. They like oxygen. They need oxygen to survive. If you flood that soil, you saturate that soil, you take all the oxygen out of that soil. So the bacteria in that soil, they do everything they can to survive. So they start ripping oxygen off the nitrate molecule. And when they do that, they turn that into a gas. And that not into gas works its way up through the moisture in the soil profile up into the atmosphere, and it's gone. And your nitrogen depletion percentage went down. So let's look at the nitrification process, and I'm not, you know, expecting you to understand this or, or memorize it or anything like that. But all fertilizer, unless it's in the nitrate form or the plant takes it up as ammonium, goes through this nitrification process. So urea would go from urea to ammonium or, or ammonia, and then eventually converts over to nitrate. The reason that's important is because <coughs> ammonium is Simple term, stable in the soil. It's not going anywhere. It's going to attach the soil colloids. It's not going to go anywhere. Nitrate is where we can lose it. Once it gets into the nitrate form, that's the form that can be leached or denitrified. Okay? And so we want to keep it in the stable form as long as possible. And that's where nitrification inhibitors come into play. They slow this process down, keep it in a stable form so we can't lose it, um, and, and so at that, but the, the ammonium is plant available. Plants can take up ammonium, you know, that's how rice takes it up. But the plants got, the roots got to come into contact with it. And so, you know, we're not, it's not keeping it unavailable, it's just keeping it more stable in the soil. And so it slows this process down. The nitrification inhibitors on the market today work on this AMO enzyme inside the nitrous ammonia sac bacteria, uh, bacteria. So. Okay, so let's take a closer look at denitrification. This was a study that was done at the University of Nebraska. And they were looking at like how long did it take, you know, for days of saturation at certain temperatures. It's bacteria driven, so it is very temperature dependent in the soil. So where they kept the soil saturated for five days at 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, they lost 10% of the nitrate that was in the soil. Where it saturated at 10 days at the same temperature, 55 to 60 degrees, they lost 25% of the nitrate that was in the soil. But look what happens when you kick the soil temperature up. Soil temperature was 75 to 80 degrees, and after three days, they lost 60% of the nitrate that was in the soil. So the warmer it is, the wetter it is, the more nitrogen you're going to lose to denitrification. All right? So you think about conditions when we're applying nitrogen here in the south. Warmer, wetter. You know, we're losing a lot of nitrogen, or could potentially lose a lot of nitrogen uh, to denitrification. Okay, so here's some data. This was from LSU, uh, 2013. Uh, this was done at Winsboro, okay? And I like to show this data because it shows the, the, 
how the different inhibitors work and how they can help protect your nitrogen from loss and protect you. Okay? So I'm going to kind of rush through this a little bit because i got a slide that we get in a little more detail about it because i got a couple, about three slides here. But we got untreated urea. We got urea treated with agritain. And so agritain is only going to protect you from that volatilization. Okay? It's only going to protect you from volatilization. We got Super U. Super U has both inhibitors. It protects you from volatilization, leaching, and denitrification. It protects you from all three forms of loss. And then we got uh, urea with instinct. Instinct uh, nitropyrin Cretavis product. It's a nitrification inhibitor. It works. It's only going to protect you from leaching and denitrification losses. It doesn't give you the protection from, from volatilization. So in this case, I can look at this data and tell you that volatilization was the main loss pathway. Because look at the difference between my agritain and untreated urea. And we'll get into more of the numbers here in a minute. But I did have some loss because my instinct was, was greater than my untreated urea. So I had some below ground losses as well. But to maximize yield, I needed to protect against all three forms of loss. And that's where the superior came into play. Okay, same study, same setup. Same year, just different location. This was at St. Joseph uh, at North, uh, Northeast Research Station. So same year, same everything, just different location within Louisiana. And in this case, same treatments, below ground losses. Denitrification was my main loss pathway. Because look at the difference between my untreated urea and my urea treated with instant. I had a pretty, you know, almost a 30 bushel difference. But I had some volatilization because my urea, my agritain was better than my urea alone. So I had some volatilization. The main loss in this case was denitrification. Again, to maximize yield, I needed to protect against all three. Okay, so the next slide, we're gonna look at these two studies together, okay? So in this instance, I got the Winsboro data here, the St. Joseph data here, and the average of those two, uh, those two there. And this is the yield advantage. We're looking at the yield advantage over untreated urea by itself. So in Winsboro, the instinct, so the gray bar is instinct, agritain, superior. And in, in Winsboro, we got we got we gained nine bushels from protect uh, from protecting that nitrogen, that urea, from denitrification. But we got 25 bushel from protecting it from volatilization. Okay. But you add the two together, and that comes up to what, 31? Or, sorry, 34? So pretty close to what we got with Super U. When you protect it against volatilization, leaching, and denitrification, you pretty much gain both of those that you protected when you only protect it against one loss. Okay? Now you look at your St. Joseph, we lost 27 bushel to denitrification losses, the low ground losses. And they lost 12 bushel to volatilization. You add those together, what is that, 39 bushel? See, you got 40 bushel with this with the super year. So you're able to gain that, protect that from all three forms of loss and maximize your yield when you protect it from all three forms of loss. Look at the average. So average those two together, we lost 18 bushels of denitrification and leaching. We lost 19 bushels to volatilization. Add them together, it's 37 bushel. Our super year was 36 bushel better. So you're able to protect that loss protect it from volatilization, protect it from leaching and denitrification, and maximize your yield potential when you protect. Sometimes we forget, I think, to, we think about, oh, I got protected from volatilization, but we don't, we forget leaching and denitrification. <coughs> or I protect it from leaching and denitrification, but I forget to protect it from volatilization. So we got to remember to protect it from all three, three forms of loss. Okay, so just a reminder, we don't want to forget our UAN and forget that U stands for urea. And so this was a study that was done at University of Tennessee. And with UAN, this was side dress, uh, injected three and a half inches deep into the soil. And so we got untreated UAN and UAN with Agritain Plus. So Agritain Plus uh, SC that we have is a liquid uh, suspension concentrate that has all three, that the two inhibitors in it, uh, MBPT and DCD, that help protect against leaching, denitrification, and volatilization. So it's kind of like the super U for UAN. It's got, got all those ingredients into it. And in this case, uh, we had a 16 bushel uh, yield response 
uh, from protecting against all three forms of loss. Now, putting it three and a half inches deep, you wouldn't think you'd have volatilization losses unless it was wet when they applied it and the slot was open or it was really dry uh, up top and you had a bunch of pore space there. But again, 16 bush. So don't forget that UAN. Make it on time? <laughs> All right. Questions? I know I kind of went through that pretty quick. I didn't think I was going to make it. So. Questions on? Question. Yes. I wonder if anybody's ever tested uh, the acidifying. There's been tests uh, uh, measuring acidifying effects of the various forms of nitrogen, but comparing untreated urea with super U. I wonder how that would work out. Uh, it's going to be the same. Uh, what, what about volatilization of the urea, though? Well, in that case, if you lose the nitrogen, your super U is going to acidify it more because you lost the nitrogen volatilization. Right. So you have more right. nitrogen in the soil. So yeah. So that test was done before the invention of super U. So sure. Sure. It gets. Well, that's what we got lined. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but no, it would because the reason your acidity would go down more than untreated urea is because you're protecting nitrogen. You got more nitrogen in the soil. So yeah. so yeah. I'd rather have the more nitrogen in the soil and the yield than uh, buy and then take that money I got from all the yield and buy a little lime. Yes, sir. The split applications in corn, do you feel you still need to aggregate at like B10 if we're going to go on with an airplane application? Uh, yes, I would because you're still making a surface application. You know. Um, Anytime you're putting that on the surface, you're, you're risking it to lose that volatilization. How many days is it going to keep the urea out of the soil profile? Uh, it, it's 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 pretty goes pretty quick. I mean, you're you, it's it doesn't just hold all the urea as urea and then release it later. It just slows that process down. So urea is being converted to ammonium right away. It's just slower than if it was straight urea. So you're right away you're getting getting available nitrogen. So you're, it's not it'll be available right now. Some of that. It's just a slower process. You might in untreated degree at that temperature, it might take just twenty four to forty eight hours to convert. And if you're the, the super U or the urea with aggregate, and you might be looking at three days for all of it. So it's not a whole net for and then the time of this time. So if we're using three apps that you read in the corn, you think we should use a full label rate? Uh, yeah. I mean, anytime I mean you're putting it on the surface, you're you're subject to volatilization loss. Because I mean, it doesn't take take long to you know you lose 40, 50 percent of it on one application. You know, to pay for your everything for all three applications. You were talking about watering it in. A lot of our practice would be furrow irrigation. Mm -hmm. What's the efficacy there, in your opinion, versus overhead in a one inch rain? Yeah, well, you're going to get it worked in, in in the furrows, but on the ridges, you're not. So, in fact, by wetting that down, you, you're actually going to have more volatilization on those, on those beds yep. because you created the perfect environment for volatilization. Yeah, and a lot of ours is every other road too, so that middle will be so good. Yeah, those, yeah. yeah, you're going to have a lot of volatilization.